Welcome to Math and Project-Based Learning. In this webinar, you are going to experience vignettes of Math PBL, understand the essential elements of PBL, and how to create a project of your own. My name is Talena Norfar. I taught high school math for six years. I just stepped out of the classroom this year to be a technology coach. I am so excited to share with you my classroom. For the next few moments, you are students in my classroom. Welcome to Norfar World. I am your mathematics instructor and the CEO of a fictional consulting company called Logic Incorporated. You are math mathematics consultants, excuse me, who help individuals, families, organizations, and companies solve their problems using mathematical principles. When we are not helping clients, we are improving our mathematical skills. At different times, some of you will be managers as well as subject matter experts, or we call it SME for short. Before I introduce you to our first client, let's have a little discussion. Movie theaters is a multi-billion dollar business. What comes to your mind when you think about going to the movies? Pause the video while you write your comments at one of the sites on the screen, today's meet.com forward slash math PBL or the shortened Google URL. Unpause the video when you are done. Let's check out some of the answers. Wow, you really enjoy the movies. Um, I really like popcorn too. And I like escaping um, to a movie. I am so glad you enjoy the movies because our first client is a locally owned movie theater. The theater has seen, seen a decline in attendance. They make their money at the concession stands are, and are needing to find ways to cut their costs. They want to redesign their popcorn containers. So let's look at their request. As you can tell, the client currently has four different popcorn sizes um, or containers is a, the more appropriate way to name it. The smallest cost is $0.79, cents, while the largest cost is $1.39. They want to, um, the design of the container to be updated. They want our proposal of changes by February 7th. With this in mind, how can you design a popcorn container that appears to contain more popcorn but costs less to produce for the theater? You know, when we approach a problem, we always think about what we know and what we need to know. So go to either site again and write what you know and what you need to know. Pause the video until you are done. Let's check out your answers. Whoa, this is a really good list of things to know. We are, we are told there are four items and the cost of the container. But you know, I noticed that no one said anything about the due date. Do you think that is important to know? Yeah, I agree. Can someone type and add that later? You also listed some great questions on what we need to know. We do need to know about restrictions on shapes. What shapes appear larger but smaller? Those are great things we need to know. You know, this is a great start to help us being able to complete this project. There is a lot we're going to have to learn and do. And I think in order to solve it, we must answer all these things we need to know. It would help if we break into teams to get it done. I would also um, think that each person has an expertise. So, um, that, so I thought about that and what we should need. Let's look at it. For this project, there are four expertise needed. They are manager, designer, researcher, and quality controller. The manager leads team meetings and reports to me. The designer understands branding and design of the containers. The researcher finds out all of the information about the client and looks at any needed information. The quality controller, quality controller double checks the team's findings. Which role do you think you would feel best? I will use your answers to place you in groups. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. The bell is going to ring. So pull out your cell phone and text your role to the number on the screen. Make sure you place... The at symbol WIF 90040 before stating your role. Pause the video until you're complete with your answers. And if you really want to know the, um, what you placed and everybody else, 
You can check out your answer at the link on the screen. Okay, now tomorrow we will get in our teams and start to work on finding out our need to knows. What do you guys think about ta us tackling the question about 3D shapes appear um, bigger tomorrow? What? A okay, great. I think I can help you with that one. So let's start with it tomorrow. Have a great day. You know, welcome back. Let's get started with answering this question. Um, and throughout this whole process, we're going to be pondering various questions in addition to the overall project question. Some that you generate and some that I generate. Um, most questions require us figuring out the answers to those questions before we even discover another one. Pause the video while you go to the sites on the screen to record your answers. Unpause when you're complete. Wow, you guys really understand what math may be needed. Volume, profit, surface area. Yeah, I think all of those will be essential. You know, we're going to have the opportunity to interview an expert and confirm what we're thinking. But, you know, it's probably safe to say that we're going to be dealing with a lot of 2D shapes, 3D shapes, um, volume, and surface area. So today, let's get started on understanding 3D shapes. Get your calculators out and let's do um, the first investigation together. And then I'm going to divide you up into your teams and you will complete the remaining investigations together. So, as you can see, take a moment and calculate the volume of the three prisms. Um, and the formula for volume is on the right. It's length times width times height. You may recall that from some previous math classes. After calculating all three prisms, you know, think about what they would look like in 3D, which would look the largest and why. Pause the video and record your answers at one of the sites above. Oh man, great job. You know, I noticed one of you noticed that how the height was the same for all three prisms. That was a great observation. So how does that change what it would look like? Um, which one would look bigger? Um, you also did well on your calculations. Uh, I want to hold off saying more about your results until you finish the entire investigation. So you'll get divided up into your teams now and keep investigating the other problem, um, the other questions. Okay, thank you so much for being great students for the last few moments. We will conclude this um, vignette by seeing the conclusion from my actual students. You know, every student in this project, it was called the Popcorn Project, designed the shape and dimensions of the container. The team then decided which designs they would use. Um, students gave feedback on the designs. This is an example of one of the 2D and 3D designs that a team produced um, for the client presentation. Students also had to complete a written proposal that included the two-dimensional design, which um, some of them had the ability to uh, create it in Google SketchUp or they could do it by hand. Um, now let's talk about the essential elements of PBL in light of what you just experienced. We will also look at how they help you create a math project of your own. Um, these are the eight essential elements of PBL. So you notice significant content and 21st century skills are at the center. And then on the outside, we have in-depth inquiry, driving question, need to know, voice and choice, revision and reflection, and public audience. When I create a project, I make sure all of these elements are included. Let me give you a brief description of each. Um, significant content is important knowledge and skills based on standards and key concepts. To determine the significant concept content, I often think of what concepts cross subject areas, what is essential for the next grade level, and what is used in the real world. You know, the project you experienced was from geometry concepts, as you could tell. Um, it was looking at two-dimensional and three-dimensional properties in regard to measurement. It's one of our major concepts in geometry. Um, on this slide is my state's breakdown of the standards for testing for geometry. You know, looking at the way my state values concepts helps me to see what is significant content as well. It is from significant content that I start the process of thinking about creating a project. Um, when it comes to 21st century skills, there are those skills that would help young people be more successful in the future. Um, specifically, though, we are talking about communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. 
This is a picture of two of my students in the popcorn project. And often in my math classroom, I work to create multiple opportunities for these skills to be built. I use Think, Pair, Share, and Fishbowl to help practice as well as teach the skill. Um, in the popcorn project, students wrote a proposal and presented their solution to a group of judges. This combined all of the 21st century skills. Um, you briefly experienced it when you commented on the journal entry, as well as uh, deciding which group you were going to be on and the critical thinking of thinking through the shapes. Now, we also do a lot of in-depth inquiry. It's a way of thinking that um, involves asking questions, digging for answers, asking new questions, and finding supporting evidence for your conclusions. You know, most of the time in math, I believe we, we just want to show them the formula or steps some, um, sometimes too quickly. Have them practice over and over and, you know, and then we move on. But math is problem solving. It's about thinking. So, you know, therefore, instead of telling them, you know, try and have them discover. In Popcorn Project, students completed um, various inquiry activities. For example, students investigated the effects of measurements on the volume of basic shapes like a rectangular prism. You know, this activity led the students to think about what other shapes may appear big but actually hold less volume. Um, this is a picture of a student actually creating their own design, and they had to think about those um, aspects as they created the design. But I thought I might want to help you with um, how do I come up with those inquiry activities, and this is basically the steps I go through. I ask myself some questions. Um, what big ideas do I want students to ponder? And basically, this helps me focus on when to create specific inquiry moments throughout the project. But then also, what sub-questions um, that get to the big ideas? You know, the sub-questions will be then placed on, on journal opportunities or specific activities. And then when I think about what activities can help them understand the big ideas, I search my textbook or internet or other teachers and collaborative inquiry activity books, you know, to place within the project. And then lastly, I think about what technology or resources people can I, um, and particularly people, can I use to support the pro uh, activities. I use supplies already available in my school or people available in my school as much as possible. Um, sometimes I don't have a piece of technology or resource, so I seek out ways to get the resource. Um, some ways I've gained this is by grants and business donations. You know, since I mentioned technology is one of the things I think about, let me explain how it looks in the math classroom. So, you know, when I was in the classroom, I used technology every day to support my students' learning. I've had students use various tools, um, clickers, podcasts, Inspire Data, and, and Veneer. I also have students work individually and in groups with basic equipment, you know, like rulers, protractors, and calculators to investigate as well. You know, to help you understand it even more, let me give you a, a couple of specific projects. You know, in the picture above, that's the actually a water project. In it, students used a water testing kit from a local hardware store, but they also used a veneer equipment, as you see, to test pH balance of the water. In the same project, students used um, Google Apps, the spreadsheet function, to collect data for analysis. Students in three classrooms tracked their water consumption for a week. Um, and then students took that and created an average and placed it in the spreadsheet. But then they did a comparison and basically answered questions and developed more questions. So rather than just have the students calculate measures of central tendency, students had to apply it. Um, I found that when you use technology, it frees the learning process from staying at the lower level of Bloom's taxonomy. You um, move from basically remember to an analysis immediately. So now let's look at driving question, um, which is what a project is organized around. It captures the issue or problem or challenge for the student. Um, it's open-ended, meaning there's more than one possible answer. Um, and the DQ for our experience was how can you design a popcorn container that appears to contain more popcorn but costs less to produce for the theater. You know, I found that it's really interesting, um, tempting, and interesting how we, as math teachers, we, we want to put the concept in it. But I want to encourage you that really isn't necessary. It's okay, but it's not necessary. And I found it helpful to include a role or the product in the question. This helps them um, get to the content. 
So here's some examples of uh, driving questions from past projects of mine. The first three were from an Algebra 1 class. The Cumbie question um, was actually a geometry. And the Young's question was Algebra 2. The last one is actually one I was thinking about doing for an Algebra 2 class before I left the classroom. I was going to create a project where students present proposal to the local Chamber of Com Commerce on the need to make changes based on the population growth. You know, students would need to create graphs of population over the last 50 years, um, and they would need to make a prediction of the future supported graphs. But I want to, to reemphasize, notice how sometimes it's um, a role or a defined product that I often use in a math classroom. Need to know is a key concept in PBL as well. The project creates a need to know for students. You know, in traditional education, typically students are told, um, you know, that they need to learn something because it's going to be on the test. Well, you know, that doesn't motivate some students. Um, that Well, that may motivate, you know, some, but most of the time it doesn't motivate most students. And, you know, if we're honest, if we think about it, an intriguing question um, is a lot more motivating uh, for students. You know, the fact that students are going to make a public presentation as well when you pose a question and a big challenge also creates a need to know the material because they don't want to look bad in front of an audience. So teachers can activate students' need to know the math by launching a project with an entry event. That engages interest and it in initiates questions like, you know, in this picture did for the popcorn project. But an entry event can also be, um, you know, almost anything, a, a video, a lively discussion, a guest speaker, a field trip, or my correspondence. But remember, you know, it's about piquing their interest and, and wanting them to ask more questions. Voice and choice is where students have opportunities to input on important matters. Um, like, for instance, the topics to study or the questions asked. Um, the text or resources used, products created, use of time, organization of the task. Those are all examples of um, voice and choice. When you were a student, I put you in the role, um, allowed you to have input in the role you played. And you were also going to have input on what the container looked like in the design. Often I found when I'm working with younger grades, like ninth grade level um, or below, I do not give students a lot of voice and choice, but I do release the voice and choice more as they progress in grade level and how much they're familiar with doing projects. Revision and reflection, um, I believe, is an essential part. It, um, it's essential to have students revise their math rather than just do a new math problem. Revision in a math class is about students really examining the process of solving a math problem rather than just getting the right answer. You know, in my project, students examine their calculations and how errors can affect the client's solution. Students also need time to reflect on the connections of math to life. I have them journal or discuss periodically. Um, this is a picture of a gallery walk completed where students helped each other in the revision and reflection process by writing warm and cool feedback. Warm is what they liked and cool is what they wonder uh, if they should change. Um, public audience is huge. Um, presenting to an audience behind the, beyond the classmates and teachers is essential. Um, in many of my projects, students present to judges who are experts in the field or even just community members. I've often used family members and, and friends as public audiences. Um, they're more than willing to help you out. Um, I've also used the Internet as a public audience, but it doesn't have that same impact I found unless you make sure someone else from the outside comment. I think this is because students are used to publishing on the Internet now. And most of the time, they just get a reaction from their inner circle. So, you know, to have a truly commenting from outside has a, a significant impact on how they really see that this really is global. This really is on the net for everybody to see. So now you have um, an understanding of the eight elements. Let me give you a few more projects. This was the Cumbie project where students designed a house for a family of four um, who had two stepchildren that visited uh, periodically. One of the stepchildren was severely handicapped, and they had to create a blueprint, a 3D model, and a proposal um, that accommodated those situations. Uh, this is a picture of a blueprint by one of the teams um, in the Cumbie project. The students ended up presenting their findings to a construction manager, engineers, and the Cumbie family themselves, um, who they also interacted with um, during the project. The math content was scale, proportion, area, and polygons. 
Um, and the driving question was, how can we design a home for the Cumbie family? Uh, the cell phone project is where students show the school's PTO how to select the best cell phone plan. They created a brochure and a presentation. Um, this is a table of the cell phone data compiled by the students. The students then presented their brochure and the method of selecting um, the best cell phone plan to judges, which included um, PTO. And winning teams presented at the PTO meeting. And, of course, as the, way, the way they ended up showing them the accuracy of their plan was creating uh, linear graphs. So that's how the math content of writing and graphing linear equations, slope, and intercepts came into being. This was um, a collaboration between uh, science, social studies, English, and my math class. It's the food project where students presented changes to the food um, and the design of the cafeteria. Uh, this was a collaboration with my ninth grade team um, that I was on for most of my six years of teaching. Uh, they created a survey, a business proposal, a menu, graphs, and food experiment. Um, this is a picture of one of the slides we showed during the entry event. The students gave their business proposals, which contained results of the survey in graphic form. Um, the menu was supported by food experiment as well as the survey, and um, they were presented to the principal. She selected a winner who gave input into the redesign of the cafeteria, which was about to happen. So it was a really motivating project. The international project where students made financial recommendations to a fictional family, um, they moved them to Sydney. Well, the interesting thing about that is we were collaborating with a classroom in Sydney, Australia. Um, I connected with a math teacher. Um, and we basically thought it would be great to have our students uh, communicate and, and need each other to help do the project. So they created budgets. They interviewed each other for us. What, are, what is it like in our particular area? Um, and they created budgets and a report and video um, presentation of their recommendations for each other to see. Uh, this is a picture of one of the uh, budgets that they had to, or car um, comparison that they had to make. So... The uh, heavy math content was percent formulas and evaluating expressions, but they they actually, even though it was an Algebra 1 class, they actually experienced a lot more um, application of Algebra 2. Now that I've um, viewed some example projects, I want to give you a few tips before we wrap up. Um, the first tip is after completing some projects where I didn't really have some outcomes that I wanted, I realized that it would be helpful for me to do the task myself. So, you know, I do, I actually go through uh, the task. I make a rough sketch of the product and I label where my content um, would show up and how I would verify that they know it. You know, I've discovered that doing the task yourself helps you plan what scaffolding the students are going to need during the project. I also ask at the beginning of the year um, my students' interest and I try to create projects off their interest. Um, hence how the cell phone project came into being. That was a result of the interest of my students. I lean a lot on colleagues, colleagues that I've connected with on the Internet. I basically call them my colleagues and formerly my PLN um, network. You know, it's helpful to get ideas from other people to get a spark for the project. Um, I've connected a lot with science teachers and professionals. I attend conferences on a regular basis. Um, you know, the Internet is also full of project ideas that help you you connect. But I really want to um, give you a great sort of tip about connecting with colleagues. I found that my science teachers are an invaluable resource in my building because they help me build my background in inquiry and how to help students discover. And I think inquiry is not something that comes natural. Um, I know I was a very logical person. I've always been great at math. Um, and inquiry is, is not that easy you know flow you sort of discovering and looking and observing so i really you know advise you to kind of connect with a science teacher because they really really um offer some valuable help and then my last tip is you know testing quizzes still have their place in pbl you know after students have wrestled with a particular concept i give them a quiz or a test just like when i'm not doing a project um, I also ask them at the beginning and end of class questions that are like my state exam. Um, I've also given them pre-test um, before we launch a project and give them a, a post-test within the project. Um, 
So I want to let you know, um, I, I want to close out with some commonly asked questions um, that I get from people when it comes to math um, and PBL. The first one is, you know, upper level math. Where can I get project ideas for upper level math? And I want to encourage you, the BIE website is constantly being updated with project ideas. Um, some of them will be mine and as well as other people all across. Um, so you can do a search very easily um, in there. And then before I end, I'll also give you um, uh, contact uh, to keep communicating through Edmodo. Uh, and being able to get ideas and help in upper-level mathematics. Um, and then I've also gotten asked, what would you recommend for K-5, through five, such as teaching fractions? Well, first I want to point out, um, um, BIE has produced an excellent starter kit. Um, if you go on the BIE website, you can actually purchase the starter kit for elementary grades. It is absolutely wonderful. Um, but I actually did what I call the Paula Dean Project, just because I love Paula Dean. And basically, students had to, uh, it was it was not a full-blown project. It was really small. But for elementary, I really think you can, um, um, super, what I call, supersize it to the full extent. And the kids basically planned out a party. Um, but they had to completely design the menu and a budget. Uh, and uh, what you'll discover is when it comes to planning out the menu and upping the sizes of recipes, which always includes fractions, uh, it causes them to really think about how do I um, increase a recipe? How do I decrease a recipe? So that's my um, two top recommendations for K through five people. Um, uh, three more commonly asked questions is, you know, do you differentiate with PBL? And if so, what does that look like in my projects? Well, one, I want to um, have you check out this link. We, um, John McCarthy did a great job on helping understand differentiating in PBL. Uh, the one thing I would add, uh, because everything you said was perfect, is I've discovered, and especially in the math classroom, as I mentioned, when I start to plan out a, a PBL, I, I'm forced to think about differentiation. I'm forced to think about all of the different resources because my kids are going to be asking the questions. And so, therefore, I have to equip them at their what they requested, um, give them help and differentiate on supporting them and finding the resources that meet them. So that leads to a, another question of, you know, am I using text or several texts or web, web resources to teach concepts, standards, underline the projects, all of the above. You know, I use my, my, my school text. I've actually accumulated from text um, reviews as well as just, my, you know, math class I've taken in college. And so we will investigate in and outside of our project, you know, how do you read these different resources? A uh, web, I found students finding awesome things on the web on their own as well as, you know, me supporting them with certain things. But here's a big question. You know, do I have a hard time covering the content? And uh, at first, I have to admit, I was a little concerned that I, that that would be the case. But what I discovered is, is I actually went from covering to deepening um, because the students with the significant content are really wrestling and the learning um, ends up being compounded. So uh, so I, I discovered more and more how much I'm deepening rather than than covering. Uh, as we wrap up, I want to encourage you uh, to check out our resources on BIE.org again. I really appreciate you attending this webinar. And I really hope you will join Edmodo if you have not already. And then go inside Edmodo and join our community. When you, when you go to Edmodo.com, you will have to register um, that you're a teacher. Um, but if you've done that, if you go in and actually just type this full link, you will be able to follow us, uh, follow BIE and the over 2,500 members we have there. I'm there. Other um, national faculty members are there. Please come continue the conversation of math and PBL with me on Edmodo. Thanks again for attending this webinar.